Planet TV, I'm Richard D. Hall. We've mentioned NASA on the show many times before, and I have even had email contact with Robert Manning, an engineer who is ostensibly the chief engineer on the Mars Curiosity program. He agreed to answer technical questions about the mission, but then ran away from my questions when it seemed he could not answer them, affirming the phrase that NASA stands for, never a straight answer. If you don't believe what I have just said, then please watch this lecture from the link on the screen, which includes evidence that Curiosity may not be situated on Mars and could be in the Canadian Arctic. I am joined today by somebody who has also had communication with NASA, albeit in a slightly more surreptitious method. I'd like to welcome onto Rich Planet, Gary McKinnon. Welcome, Gary. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for having me on. All right, then. Um, I think... A large number of uh, my viewers will know who you are already and, and have the outline uh, of your story, um, which we will go through the, the basic points of today. Yep. Um, and it started with an interest in, in UFOs. Uh, can you tell us first, uh, when did your interest in UFOs start? Um, UFOs specifically, well I was always into stars, apparently even when I was three years old I was always asking about the stars and stuff. So. I was always looking at the sky from a young age. Your interest in UFOs goes back a long way, and I've not heard this on mainstream TV before, right, right back to the age of when you were 12. Yep. So tell us about that. Um, my stepfather, because my parents split up when I was six, and we moved out from Glasgow to London. Uh, my stepfather was an avid science fiction fan, um, so I suppose that's what really got me into all that sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, science fiction, you get interested in aliens and UFOs and the possibility of life in outer space and contact with other beings is probably one of the most exciting things we can imagine, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, so that I then joined Bufora, the British UFO Research Association, when I was about 12. It was a, it was a subscription-based thing and you got a, a monthly newsletter, if I remember rightly. It was a long time ago now. Right, um, right. Yeah. All right, so how did you find out about the Disclosure Project? Well, obviously, having an interest in UFOs, when the internet came to Britain in the mid-90s, mm -hmm. Uh, an incredible resource for UFO information. And um, so after a while, you do stumble across the... Well, actually, I was already interested in just finding out stuff. But then, was it 2000 or 2001? 2001 was the conference. The, the that's, that's what really got me going, that conference. Right. To me, that was mind-blowing, all these high-level witnesses. You know. Right, because it, it wasn't widely publicised. No. So how, how did you know about it when it, when it came about? Um, I think someone else told me, um, and they told me before it was actually, before the event took place. Mm -hmm. But I remember, I think I'm right in remembering at the time, they had uh, some kind of broadcast failure as well. Right. Um, so it didn't reach the sort of multicast internet audience that they hoped it would at the time. Okay. Yeah. So that was your inspiration to try and find out more, the, the Disclosure mm -hmm. Project, or one of the pieces of inspiration. So. I gather it was after the Disclosure Project conference that you got sort of caught red-handed with your computer-related activities. Yeah. Um, w were you involved in computer-related activities uh, before the Disclosure Project, or was it, or was that the? Uh, that that was that was the instigator to right having a look. Right. <laughs> if I can call it that. All right. So, so yeah. can you just tell us how you went about trying to find out information that you thought was being kept secret? Yep. Um, part of the, one of the Disclosure Project witnesses is uh, Donna Hare, and um, she was working at Johnson Space Center at NASA. Uh, she had secret clearance. She was a, a photographic sort of mission launch specialist. Mm -hmm. And um, she said that one day when she was working in Building 8, so she actually mentioned the building of uh, Johnson Space Center, JSC, um, there was a colleague who was in another room, but they all, they all had secret clearance, but they were on different projects. Mm -hmm. And um, she was in this chap's lab or room, whatever it is, and he said to her, come and take a look at this, you know, what do you think this might be? And um, he showed her a picture of uh, a large white disk, uh, presumably a satellite photograph, uh, above the Earth, but not very high above the Earth, because there was um, a shadow on the trees, which Donna Hare didn't spot at first. And being a, a photographic expert, she said, well, is that a blob in the emulsion? That's her first professional thought. And the guy said, blobs in the emulsion don't cast circular shadows. And uh, she basically said that he told her his entire lab was to do with airbrushing out UFOs from higher res satellite imagery from NASA because they're so preponderant mm -hmm. around the planet. 
Right, and the, she gave the name of the building that she was working in. Building 8. Building 8. Mm. So, <coughs> um, just tell us then technically how you went about trying to access in information like that. Yeah. Um, well, I was already on Johnson Space Center, you know, in terms of my illegal presence there, uh, because they ran Windows. Um, they were running something called NetBIOS over the Internet. NetBIOS is a, an office protocol, basically, for Windows. It's very insecure. There's no way you should be running that open to the Internet. So it was very easy to get in. And um, So I'll just interrupt you there, Gary. So you, you would need the IP address that's running the NetBIOS initially to try and uh, request data from it, yeah? Yeah. So, you, so, so, so how did you find the IP address of Building 8 or, or whatever system you were, you were okay. trying to access? Yeah. Well, you can, um, you can. That's publicly available, is it? Oh yeah, there's, there's online services where you can you can type in, you know, Johnson Space Center, or the network name, which I think was JSC-NASA-Gov, and uh, they give you the whole IP block that they own. Right. And somewhat stupidly, uh, NASA, just like the military and everyone else, wasn't using non-routable uh, internet addresses, like which are safe for offices because they're they're private. You know, mm. what I mean. So this is what you call an internet-facing IP address yeah. on a desktop computer? Um, is that yeah, the desktop computers, the main servers. So there was obviously. no firewall at all? It's as if, so you could ping the computers yep. in NASA on a desk from your own router? Yeah, some of them wouldn't ping, but I'd still probe them just in case they didn't reply to pings, but they were still live machines. Right. So you, you, you gained access to a whole raft of, of computer systems within... Well... W w w can I ask you, was it just NASA? Or oh no, they're all like this. Um, that, that was I used that one single method mm -hmm. to gain entry to the places I got into. Right, and are you allowed to say which other places you got into? Or well, I'll say it was it was the army, the navy, and NASA, and the Pentagon. Right, the right. And are they were they all on separate banks of IP addresses? Each of those that you've just mentioned. Oh yeah, yeah, completely separate blocks. Right. Yeah. So you knew you, whether you were whether you were trying to access NASA or Pentagon or Army, Navy. They're all in completely different IP ranges. Yeah, yeah. But right. once, once you're in there, it can better get a bit confusing because once you start exploring, there's attached networks, other networks, private networks, and in the end, you're not really sure where you are after a while. But right. Uh, all right. So it was. It was quite comprehensive, this sort of amount of access that you had. And I've heard you say that there were other people there who also do oh. what you were doing. And, and would you say that you were one of the more, more prolific pers people doing that? Did you get an impression or, or would you not be able to say? I can't say because I don't know what they were doing, but um, I did a simple command because when, when you're on there, at first I was using the command line interface, so it's just a black box. And, uh, but you do a command on Windows called netstat, and you can see all the other connections to the same machine. And then you can look up for those IP addresses and think, well, God, they're from China, they're from Denmark, they're from Turkey. It's like the whole world was in these machines. And I knew that was wrong, because there's no way people from all over the world should be on NASA machines. Mm -hmm. So they must have all been unwelcome guests like I was. Right. So what period of time from when you first accessed the first uh, system to when you got arrested, what sort of, what's the duration we're talking? Oh, like 18 months, two years. Right, mm -hmm. all right. So you, you, did you have any feeling at the time that you might get collared for this at all? No, because I thought, initially when the security so lax anyway, um, I thought, well, if, if it's that easy to get in, then they probably aren't monitoring properly. Right, so. right. all right. So let, let's um, talk about what you saw before we go on to then what happened with the arrest and everything. Yeah. Um, <coughs> how long was it before you saw anything that, of any sort of significance? Oh, a long time. Right. Um, you know, months and months. Uh, so did you not get bored with it, or was it always keeping your fascination with what, what kept you going back if you didn't get anything for, for months and months? Oh, the promise of possibly finding something. Right. And, the, and the fact it was so easy, and I thought at some point this is going to close the store and they'll stop running NetBIOS over the internet. Right. And you won't be able to find blank passwords so easily. Right. And every time you, you were in uh, communicating with a particular I online IP address, did, would you always know which building you were accessing computers from? No, not at all. Not, not the physical building. Right. No, no. Right. All right, so just tell us um, when you got your first hit, if you like, as regards actually seeing something interesting. The first thing was, was documentation. Um, I used a program called Land Search, I think, that once you had control over the domain, um, because you'd get control of domain controllers, so you own the whole network, basically. 
and uh, LAN search could actually search all the files and folders on every machine. And obviously it's hard because things aren't going to be called secret UFO data dot PDF, are they? Mm. So, um, but I'd scan and look for documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and I found an Excel spreadsheet that was actually called, or at least in, in the heading of the column, it said non-terrestrial officers. And I was like, my bloody God, that's just non-terrestrial officers. non-terrestrial officers with um, ranks and names, mm -hmm. and uh, then a separate sheet uh, with tabs for material transfer between ships. And these were, I mean, I don't remember the names now. That's you know, a long time ago. A lot of people give me a hard time for not remembering the names and stuff, but it was a long time ago. Right. But uh, non-terrestrial officers thought, well, it must be, let's try and cut out all the possible um, conventional explanations first. I searched for that term. It was nowhere. It was right. nowhere at all. Now, if you search for the term, you only find links to me and right. stuff that I've said. Right, right. I see. I see. So it wasn't a standard thing in the military at all. Right. Um, so I took that to be. They must have a space-based, a secret space-based... So the non-terrestrial officers, what, it couldn't be astronauts? It could be. I mean, that, that's the thing. It's up to you how you interpret that, isn't it? Right. But these ships were called USS whatever and USS whatever. So they started with USS. Yeah, so that, that implies Navy. And I think the Navy, the Navy do a lot of space stuff, right. the US Navy. And, and how many Navy. officers' names would, would you estimate were listed and how many ships mm. were listed? Probably, oh, God. I think there's probably one screen full of officers' names. So what's that, 25 rows? Right. An Excel okay. spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And these were low-resolution days as well. So you're talking yeah. about 800 by 600 screens, so not very big. Uh, but the ships was probably, I don't know, a third of the spreadsheet. So estimate how many different ship names you saw? Oh, God, maybe eight, ten. Eight or ten. Yeah. And d am I right in thinking that you then tried to search for those specific names? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. And... Did it find a thing? Right. So you think that they could be classified? Not, not the names of the people, the names of the ships. Yeah, yeah. but they could be classified, uh, secret or top secret, names of s some sort of craft or ship. Yeah, obviously not public. Right. So All right, Gary. Well, we'll continue this uh, after the break. Welcome back. I'm talking to Gary McKinnon about um, when he accessed NASA computer systems and found some very interesting information on there. Uh, I've given lectures, Gary, about uh, the TR-3B, and in those lectures, this is, this is an alleged secret aircraft, uh, and in those lectures I've sort of put forward the case that it's not really NASA that's possibly designed that technology, that it's maybe the, the, some secret part of the Air Force and the NSA that is, is controlling the information. This comes from Edgar Fouché, a whistleblower. Right. And th that NASA are, or at least publicly, predominantly put on display rockets. I don't think there's anything more advanced propulsion-wise th than a rocket. Mm. So d d what are your feelings on that? What, what do, do you th the fact that you've, you've been into a NASA establishment uh, systems and you're finding non-terrestrial officers. So I'll put the question, d d don't you think there would be somewhere else like the NSA? Well, um, the non-terrestrial officers, I think, was on a Navy system. Right. Did, I, did, did I say that earlier? I think I did. Oh, that wasn't in NASA? No, that was on a Navy system. Right, I see. If I remember rightly, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Right, okay, so, that, so the non-terrestrial officers uh, spreadsheet, that wasn't in a NASA building, you don't think? No, no. All oh, right, that was in the Navy. Yeah. Right, okay. Uh, and in the in the um, the actual ships as well, you mentioned there was names of ships. That yeah. was that was navy as well. Yeah. So that had, right. So that that wasn't in a NASA folder in in building eight in. No. Right. No. I see. All right. So that's that could explain the the question that I've just asked there. So just to stay on this side track, w what are your feelings on the on the Apollo missions? Do, 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 do you do you buy into the we never went to the moon, or do you have a strong position, or are you open minded? What what's your um, I think when you think about things like the Van Allen belts and the radiation um, and the film on the cameras, uh, the battery on the module, there's a lot of you know, solid scientific reasons why it was impossible with the technology back then. Right, right. All right. Well, e even the computer power back then makes me slightly suspect. Right. But all right, well, you've answered that question. So you mentioned, you mentioned Donna Hare before, whose colleague was involved in airbrushing UFOs out of NASA images. Mm. And this allegedly took place in Building 8 
at the Johnson Space Centre? That's think? right. Right. Yeah. So you accessed computer systems there. Tell me what you found. Right. Because Donna Hare had said it was Building 8, uh, when you're in the command line interface and you type in NetStan, Windows has a, a function where when you list all the machines on the network, there's a comment field. And NASA had used a comment field uh, for standard computer audit information that said this isn't Building Blah, that you know, this is the serial number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So finding building eight was surprisingly easy. Mm -hmm. Surprisingly easy. And uh, so then I scanned that subnet. So I think it was only 255 machines on the subnet for building eight. And um, there they were. These all these machines with blank administrator passwords. It was it was as if when they built the network, they'd used an image and blatted out the image to every machine, because every single machine had a blank administrator password. Mm -hmm. An administrator gives you full control, so it's, it was a ridiculous. In building at Johnson Space Center, I found out there were files, sorry, folders, called uh, raw and filtered, or processed and unprocessed. And these files were like 200 odd megabytes, you know, 250 megabytes. They were in a proprietary NASA format. And um, this is in the days of 56K dial-up, so you, know, you could download them in like five minutes. And uh, I wanted to you know, get on there, find out what I could, and get out quickly. And so I had remote control of the desktop using a program called Remotely Anywhere. And um, so if you double clicked on an image, their proprietary software came up, and the image was there. But it wasn't there like that, because it's a slow connection. Um, I turned it down to, I think, 2-bit or 4-bit color. I can't remember if it was monochrome or just 4-bit four, four color. And uh, it started you know, juddering down the screen. I think Remotely Anywhere, anywhere was a Java app at the time. And I uh, only got to see about half or two-thirds of it or something. But it was a hemisphere of a planet, which I assume was Earth, because it was blue and it was cloudy. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it was a, a classic cigar shape uh, with you know, no seams, no rivets, no sort of workmanship on the outside. But it did have one sort of human-looking thing, which was the sort of geodesic domes that you see at Men With Hell. Um, above and below, to the left and the right, and one you know, on its nose, and I assume, sorry, one on this side, and I assume one on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, some people say that could have been man made because of that geodesic dome feature. Um, but the fact of it all flowed in, there was no, there's the tube, and there's a socket for the dome. Mm -hmm. you know? It was all a flowing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when I saw someone else, the mouse moved, right clicked on the LAN icon, disconnect, and boom, all was gone. When you saw that particular image, d did that then lead to your arrest? Yeah, because um, when they disconnected me, they obviously got my IP address because I was doing a direct connection foolishly at that time because I was getting lazy or cavalier. And uh, it was NASA that contacted BT and about the IP address. Then you get the client's address through the police, UK police. So that was that's what got me caught. Right. Yeah. So that then started... Uh, well, how many, how many years was the, was the legal battle going on? Nearly 11 years, from March 2002 till October 2012. So the first you found out about it was you got a knock at the door? Yeah. So just <laughs> explain what happened on that day. Crikey. Um, I'd, I'd stopped doing the hacking, if you can call it that, you know, blank password phishing. And um, I think I'd been playing this PC game called Galactic Civilizations <laughs> all mm -hmm. night at about 3 o'clock. So I'd only been asleep for a few hours. And uh, next thing I know, there's someone saying, Gary McKinnon, Gary McKinnon, <laughs> and prodding right. me. And I woke up to find uh, a detective, whatever he was, from the National High Tech Crime Unit, saying you're under arrest for, well, I assume he said hacking into NASA. I can't right. remember now. But right. and, and so did they take you away from your home then? No, the first thing they did was a, a massive search. They searched my girlfriend. They searched me. Um, they searched the house, they took away the computers, not just the hard drives, they took away all the computers. I was fixing computers for people as well, and they took away all of those. <laughs> yeah. Right. So did they give you them back? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, after a long time, I got back my friend's machines and client's machines that I was fixing. I got them back within a few months. But I only got my... Oh, no, I've not... I've, no, they, they never gave me back my hard drives, because they had right. evidence on them. Right. So you um, never got them back? No, no, right. because I didn't get time to get a copy of the image, but I got a copy of the non terrestrial officer spreadsheet, right. which was on my hard drive, uh, which was encrypted. Uh, but uh, I stupidly told them the password. I just fessed up to everything when I got caught. Because right. they said, oh, you'll only get six months, or probably not even that. You'll get community service. You know, you'll be fine.
So that spreadsheet that we discussed earlier <coughs> was on the hard drive that was confiscated from yeah. you, and you've never seen it again. No, which I'm is still trying to get it back. Right, so, which is why you so can't yeah. remember the names, because, yeah. because you thought you had it stored on your hard drive. Yeah. Right. Um, all right, so, so as you said, initially they said to you, oh, you'll get some community service or something like this. So why did, why did that then turn into an extradition request and a threat for 60 or 70 years in prison? How did that progress from mm. up, up the chain? Well, what happened, the NHTCU officers went to Washington, and um, when they came back from Washington, um, they'd obviously been extremely impressed by talking to the top brass over there, who'd obviously said, yes, yeah, very serious case, he's a very dangerous man. Uh, just like the this is the Americans said this? Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I'm assuming, because the officers came back with a completely different attitude. No longer was it six months of community service now. It's a very serious thing. You know? Right, so they arrested you. They were quite okay with you, confiscated your stuff. Then they went out to America yep. to speak to whoever, mm. and then they've come back with a completely different attitude. Yeah, and gave me a second interview. Right. And Because um, I didn't have a lawyer present in my first interview, and I just admitted, yeah, because I knew it was all on the hard drive where I'd been. Because I, I'd kept files and stuff, you know. Um, so there's no point in saying, no, I didn't do it. Um, so I assume I should have had a lawyer at first, and it might not have gone on for so long, who knows. But uh, I had a lawyer at the second interview, and uh, they were trying to uh, get me on conspiracy, saying, oh, we saw some of your ICQ chat logs, and we think you may have been working with other people, which I wasn't. And um, I said, well, no. But I had chatted to people about what I was doing, but I didn't involve anyone else at all. Right. Um, and it was then they started saying, well, it's very serious, you know, it could be a long jail term, the Americans, you know, really want you bad. There's a lot of pressure from Washington on uh, right. Downing Street or whatever. And, and w were they trying to twist it and say that you'd actually um, caused damage, even though you were just maintaining a silent presence? Well, this is the thing, there was, um, it wasn't until I actually saw the, the American charge sheet where they listed, you know, all the supposed damage. Um, so. I don't think the NHTCU mentioned David to me at first, but they, they kept on calling it attacks and targets, and I said, can you please not use that language, because it wasn't an attack. I was in there, and I was looking around, but I wasn't attacking, I wasn't vandalising, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, but in order to get the extradition, do they not have to prove that you've done damage? Can they extradite you just based on the fact that you're looking at stuff? This is the thing, they don't need any proof, they just need the accusation, and they need to get your name and address right, and they can take you over there. Right. As has happened to countless people since me. Right. So. Right. All right. The Americans have come down quite heavy-handed, saying they want you extradited, and the British authorities are going along with that initially. Is that right? Well, no, because um, the initial arrest was March 2002, and um, the, ex the full ratified extradition request uh, didn't come through till 2005, because our, our laws... We didn't have this special UK-US extradition treaty in place. We were still going off the 1989 extradition treaty, right. which required good evidence for right. the acute defence. So they, we think they tactically waited. We think they may even have made this law, or certainly included my case in the formation of the law, because even some of the wording of the new treaty, and the spelling was American mm -hmm. in this UK-US treaty. It was right. American spelling, ridiculous. So they waited uh, until 2005, I think it was, to present it fully. And uh, I'd got my first job in a few years because I, I, I couldn't work in IT anymore, obviously, because everyone thought, oh, hands off for a while. And uh, I got my forklift license, was working in a warehouse. Mm. And um, I got a phone call from my lawyer at work. And she said, they, they want to extradite you. You're going to stand trial in America. And that just flabbergasted me, absolutely flabbergasted me. Uh, my journalists coming around to the warehouse where I was working, my landlords threw him out of my flat. And already the first time I'd have been arrested, I lost a lot. I lost my long-term girlfriend and the place I was living in, and here it was happening all again. All right, and Gary, we'll continue this very fascinating discussion after this break. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm talking to Gary McKinnon about the fact that he accessed NASA computers and other defense establishment computers in America and witnessed some very in interesting information. When, when did the mainstream media get hold of it for the very first time? 2002, the initial arrest. Right, so that was in the mainstream media. Yeah, there, there was a peak then. Right, it? and then another peak in 2005. Yeah. So it seems grossly unfair that they can pass a new agreement or treaty and yeah. apply it to something Retrospectively, that and happened. that was in the wording of the treaty. This is retrospective as well. Right, so but, but they still were attempting to do that. Now, here's another devil's advocate question then, uh, Gary. 
wouldn't you think that they would try and keep it low key? So, in other words, say to the um, British intelligence equivalent, look, we want this kept out of the media. And I'm quite convinced that on issues like this, if they wanted it kept out of the media, they probably could keep it out of the media with denotices if they wanted to. Yeah. So I asked the question, do you think it was deliberately made into a big mainstream media issue at the request of the Americans? Well, in America, there was no media. They were definitely keeping it quiet over there, or, or they just hadn't heard of it. Right. Um, but there was, there, was, there was almost zero coverage in America. Because it, it, here's another possibility, and again, I, I'm just exploring it as a possibility, that they've looked at what you've seen, they've thought, okay, it's not massively damaging. So let's, let's let it out into the media as, as a, not a diversion, but as a, look over here, we've got other stuff over there. Do you see what I mean? So they, yeah, well, no, you're right, because also you have to remember at that time, um, that was you know, long before Anonymous and all that. That was the, the growth of hacking big time starting in the UK anyway. And um, it, was the, it was the first time there was that sort of global awareness that this could be a problem. You know, people like this could be a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that there may have been the idea that, well, if we get this one guy and do a great big show trial and make sure everyone knows about it, that'll scare off every other possible person in the future. So yeah, it, it, it allow, yeah, it allows them to be more draconian with their legislation, maybe, by, yeah. by trumpeting one case and making an example of it, mm. rather than making an example of you because you found something sensitive. Yeah. Um, well, there was one guy, a journalist I don't trust very much because he never paid me for my interview in the end. <laughs> this was, I was on the dole, and he said, oh, I'll give you 200 quid, you tell me all about your story, and blah, blah. I won't mention his name because it could be Lebel Libel. But um, he said um, that he'd gone over there and interviewed the top brass, and they said uh, that the main thing was embarrassment. But I don't actually believe that. I don't right. trust that but one journalist did say that. Right. Um, and other than that, have you got any, had any other clues as to the, the reason that's the only thing you've had? Yeah, as, because... As to the real why they're upset over it. Yeah, I mean, very strangely, the UFOs weren't really mentioned very much in the media. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I did end up being called the UFO hacker, mm -hmm. which is good because the Americans were trying to get me called the 9-11 hacker. Because right. it was, you know, they say before, during, and shortly after 9-11, he was hacking into our security you know, as if, mm -hmm. I don't know, as if, <laughs> not, not that I had something to do with it, but as just to, that emotional attachment. They yeah. use 9-11, even to this day, they use 9-11 to bring yeah. emotions out. And, yeah. Now, you've uh, done quite a lot of media interviews, Gary. One of them was the Richard and Judy oh. show. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, you were quite petrified to go on that, that show, I believe. I was terrified because Richard and Judy were a big thing back then. You know? yeah. And um, I, was, I, I really don't like being on camera. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm nervous even now after all these years. But um, I had to do it to raise awareness of the extradition treaty, its unfairness, and uh, the fact that I didn't do any damage, and there's no way it should be such a huge thing. Right. No, one thing I picked up on that, because I, I watched it on YouTube the other day, is Richard is it Maidley said um, that, that your best friend, John Ronson, he, he, he made some reference oh, to yeah. John Ronson. Yeah. Um, so c can, you, can you tell us, uh, do you know John Walton Ronson well? Or? No, no, not at all. Um, it, we, he did the first interview, I think, in The Guardian. Right. Yeah, I think that was the first interview. Um, and John Ronson's style is a bit humorous. You know, it doesn't really take his subjects very seriously. Yeah, he, yeah he's, <laughs> he's, he's condescending. Okay, yeah. In my opinion. <laughs> no, he is. And he did actually put words into my mouth uh, and then wrote them. You know, he, like, when he was talking about the damage, I said, well, I know I didn't do any damage. He said, yeah, but yeah, maybe you pressed the wrong button. So I said, well, maybe, but I don't think so. But in the interview, he said, oh, yeah, and Gary said, maybe he pressed the wrong button. So that angered me. So no, we weren't certainly weren't best friends, right? But, uh, so, so how many times did you meet him? Oh, once. Right. So <laughs> on Richard and Judy, <laughs> I think I need to check this, but I think they, they described him as your best friend or a close friend. That does ring a bell. Even your staunchest defender, a guy called uh, Mr. Ronson, who writes for the Guardian, John, John Ronson. Ronson. John Ronson. I mean, he he says that there's no way are you a threat to the American system or the American uh, defense system, but. You're just a computer nerd who went too far. That's, that's mm. what he says, and he's your best friend. Is, is, that, is that fair? Right. Why do you say that? So that's really strange why they would say that, because um, if I was to say what I think of John Ronson uh, now, it, it wouldn't get broadcast. Right. Right. Um, he's, well, I, 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 you can't I, say it. I can't <laughs> say it. Um, 
Well, thanks for clearing that up, Gary, that you just you were interviewed by John Ronson. Yeah. So that, that clears that up for me. But, so you've obviously had a lot of interaction between various officials at the Home Office and other organisations. Mm. Just tell me a bit about what you learned about the Home Office, Gary. Um, <laughs> what I learned about the Home Office was that um, I think the, old, the older crew in the Home Office uh, have strong links with Washington and they're very eager to please. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think the younger up-and-coming members are more, you know, Britain is a sovereign nation and we control what we do. Uh, well, I think they like it to be that way, some of them, not all of them. Um, but I also found or heard that, um, and this is from a very reliable source, that officials from Washington are walking around the Home Office telling people what to do. Right. Which is just not on at all, you know. It doesn't surprise me, uh, that. And... Um the BBC, you've also got opinions on the BBC. Yeah, I think they were quite unfriendly to me at first. Um, not because I did a few interviews with the BBC. And I don't think the individual producers, uh, although I did have one fairly unfriendly interview, I can't remember her name now, but I think maybe the executive producers have an agenda to push and didn't like me at first until they realised the tide was turning mm -hmm. when the Daily Mail campaign started taking off and then thought, well, this looks like this guy might win in the end, so now we'll start being more friendly. But I think if they had their way at first, I think they would have... So, so what, is, what do you think it was that changed then that went from them absolutely wanting you extradited to then dropping the extradition request? What was the reason for that? Well, why did Theresa May... Because the, the request wasn't dropped. Theresa May just refused it. All right, she refused, she refused it. Mm. OK. But my opinion of Theresa May is she's not making her own independent decisions. I, I, I would guess that uh, Washington have told her to do that. that. That would be my hunch. Well, um, that I it's not been an independent uh, th to America. I, 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 was, I heard, again from reliable sources, that um, at one point there was a plane waiting for me you know, one of those special planes that go to Turkey and Jordan now and then. All right. And that Theresa May was going to give my extradition the go-ahead. But, because I think they do make individual decisions to a certain extent. Right. But obviously they all have advisors. Um, but I think the Home Secretary is a very, very special position, unless you're Alan Johnson, who was rubbish at his job, and he admitted that himself. He said, I'm just a hack politician. Um, but I think in the end, uh, it's, it did seem to be the medical evidence. Um, right. Right. That did swing her mind. She realised that uh, it, it was a terrifying position for me. And I'd, I'd bought potassium chloride to kill myself rather than go on that plane and go over there. Right. So this, uh, when you say the medical evidence, you were diagnosed with, is it Asperger's? Yeah, by the five top people in the land. Yeah. Right. It's not something I, I, I really know much about. I mean, I don't know whether you want to talk about that aspect of it, Gary. Do you want to mention anything about that? Yeah, well, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's the, apparently I wasn't on the high end of the spectrum. I've met some people, you know, autism, that really need looking after, and they can't function on their own, you know. So they called mine high-functioning Asperger's or high-functioning autism. Yeah, Gary did get uh, the wrong train when he came here. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not bad in the 3 I'm not good in the 3D world. But <laughs> <laughs> just in the virtual world. Yeah, that's that's better. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's uh, they said my the signature of my uh, Asperger's is my extreme interest in justice and fairness and truth. Right. And apparently, a lot of us have that in common, and mm. we will work for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, mm. you know, to maybe, find the truth. Maybe I should get myself checked out. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, maybe, or maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> um, to me, the, the, the most interesting part is the the list of non-terrestrial officers mm. and, and possible undisclosed ships. Mm. Uh, were, were any mainstream journalists interested in that? No, I mean, they all, um, after the, the first interview, they obviously, they read that and they say, OK, we can ask him about this and that, but they don't, they don't go into it like you do. They don't drill down on the detail. Right. They just say, oh, so you were looking for UFOs and you found this, and then they gloss over it. Right. Right. There's no deep interest, really. Right. And I apologise to any interviewers that did ask me, because it's so long ago now, I can't remember. OK. Right. Thank you, then, Gary. Uh, we're going to go for another break, and we'll continue after this. Welcome back. I'm talking to Gary McKinnon. Now, in some of your media interviews, Gary, I've seen you talk about free energy. Mm -hmm. And I'm also very interested in that subject. And this is... Um, 
Some people would term it over-unity technology, others perhaps perpetual motion machines is another word people might use, or energy from the vacuum. And this is um, a possible untapped source of energy which is locked within uh, the vacuum or within space itself that many people believe uh, can be turned into usable energy. Uh, so my opinion is of the free energy, it's not energy from nowhere, it is coming from a source. Mm. Uh, but you've looked at s certain technologies and you've even built some of your own um, experiments. So can you just tell us about your interest in that subject? Yeah, um, I mean I started off like a lot of people being interested in Bedini. Mm -hmm. And uh, after looking at that for a while I realised that was just the magnetic collapse, the inductive spike, there was no extra energy. So you don't think there's any, any extra energy in the Bedini motor? No, and I don't think Bedini's ever claimed there was. Right, all right. right. Yeah. Have you seen any of the videos where they've got two batteries, one which is being charged mm -hmm. and the other one is kicking the, kicking the motor around? Yeah. And it seems to go for what, months or years and, and it will charge the batteries as well. That's the claim. So yeah. it's getting energy from somewhere, allegedly. So you would, you would refute that, yeah? Yeah, well, these people need to go to Battery University. Uh, using batteries to try and make accurate measurements yeah. of power in and power out is just nonsense. Yeah, I would agree. That, yeah. Yeah. So m my thought on the Bedini motor has always been, why don't they just use uh, capacitors? Yeah, then you've got an exact yeah. storage. Uh, for the input and output battery, instead they use capacitors instead. Why, why can't they redesign it with capacitors? Yeah. And then there would be no... Yeah, no room for error. No, yeah, yeah a, a nice capacitor bank. You know, that maybe still the same as the twelve volt car battery. And then, um, but uh, the one thing I did find that did seem to work was uh, there's a guy called Thane Hines, Thane mm -hmm. C Hines, and um, he constructed coils in such a way that the rise time um, lags behind the rotational movement. So normally you get lens effect, and the magnetic field you induce opposes the rotation. Uh, whereas if you can make the rise time lag by the rotation, it actually aids it, because once it's risen, the magnet's past the coil, and it pushes it around. And uh, I did my own replication of this coil and got this effect to happen. And it, I mean, I'm no physicist, so I could be wrong, but it seems to violate the work energy principle, because when you attach a load to a, a generator that's made with these coils, mm -hmm. um, the rotor speeds up, and the input current goes down. Right which violates the work energy principle. But uh, some people may say it may just be impedance matching, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know, because it seemed to work over a fairly wide range. All right, and um, a a any other, because there are hundreds of alleged devices, isn't there, aren't there? We, you, you if you can find some thorium, then you can try a nuclear battery, if you like. You know. Right. And then there's you know, isotopic decay. That, that's, it's not free energy, but it's extremely cheap, and there's no moving parts. Right. And, and you can have one of those in every home, and if people don't mind sitting on a potential nuclear explosion. Right. right. So, and uh, w what would be the legal ramifications of building something like that? Do you know? Have you looked at that? Um, funny you should ask that, because I watched uh, a video the other day about a, a guy who was 15 in America, and he scraped off all the radium and the old glow-in-the-dark alarm clocks, and uh, he got the stuff out of smoke detectors, which is radioactive, and some other stuff. And um, he ended up having the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, tearing down his shed and storing it in radioactive uh, you know, lead buckets or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, it turns out there's no law that forbids individuals from experimenting with it, or there wasn't then, but there were for corp corporations. Uh, but I wouldn't even experiment with HHO gas, let alone right. <laughs> nuclear power. So right. Right. You know, I'll stick to my magnets and coils, thanks. Right. Yeah. Right. And w what's your feeling on uh, w where the energy is stored and how it's w the mechanism is coming from the vacuum is the same? Have you, got any, have you looked at the, the physics side of it? Yeah, I mean, they do say, you know, there are these virtual particles popping in and out of existence and there is this, you know, sea of negative energy. Uh, but I'm not a physicist. I I'm, I'm not highly advanced in maths. Um, so there's a lot of I'd like to understand but can't unless I invest, you know, six months getting my maths better. Um, but even that wouldn't be free, because you are—that is coming from somewhere. And yeah. for all we know, that could be affecting something somewhere else. Yeah. We could be taking something from someone that lives somewhere else. For all we know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if other dimensions exist, which there's no evidence of, you could be sucking something from another dimension, couldn't you? On a common sense level, magnets have a push, don't they? I mean, it looks like kinetic mm -hmm. to us, you know. Yeah. And I think 
the reason they don't work in a, a normal setup is because of the balance. You know, they always cancel each other out. I think if you can find a clever way of introducing an imbalance to the magnets, like through new metal shielding or something, then you may be able to get rotation without any electrical input. Yeah. So do you so do you think this this principle has been mastered and secretized, and they've they've they've, they've got it in the secret space program or in other programs? Um, well, I mean, the, the bottom line is I I don't know, um, but if you look. Uh, you know, Tom Bearden often quotes like uh, Khrushchev and the Russians talking about their scalar electromagnetic weapons and we know that the computing power the NSA had in the 60s was huge. So yeah, the, the, we may be being trickle-fed technology as it gets developed and mm -hmm. then they've got safe control of it. They've built the machines or the weapons or whatever you know they want to build from it mm -hmm. and then we get the, the trickle-down effect and all the consumer devices. Yeah. Now, one other thing that you've looked at, Gary, is uh, images of Mars. So you've, mm -hmm. you've looked at Mars orbiters. I don't know if you've looked at lander images. Just, just tell us about that. Yeah, um, well, I, I believe they have landing probes there. Uh, I, I believe the rovers are on the surface of Mars. I haven't seen anything to make me think they're not. And unlike the lunar lander, you know, the batteries in the rovers can withstand the environment they're in. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've, I've, I've have had a question answered on the, on the batteries and how they're kept warm because there's a nuclear yeah. uh, device mm. uh, powering them, or, to keep, or to at least to keep the batteries warm. Um, but I'm not 100% <laughs> decided on, on, on what I said at the beginning there. I'm, I say 75% in the document that I've written, and it's the, well, there's a crinoid fossil. If, if, if they are on Mars, then there's a crinoid fossil there, but, but, mm. but carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, also, if they are on Mars, then there's, there's a, an oil pipeline there. Um, I found a thing. We should have got the photos, shouldn't we? We can put them up afterwards. Oh, excellent. You can email, yeah, if you email me the photographs, I'll put them on as you're talking about them. So okay. an oil pipeline on Mars, carry on. Well, <laughs> hopefully it's not an oil pipeline. I hope they're not there already. My God. Um, BP. But um, so it's, it's a huge, I only look at TIFF images, target image file format, because they're huge. You can zoom in. You can see loads of detail. I, I really don't like these people to say, oh, look, you can see a creature, and it's this blurry, fuzzy, there's too much of that. So I get these massive resolution files. I pour over every centimetre, you know, and uh, I zoomed into this thing. And it was a, a perfect cylinder, and you can see because of the highlighting that it is curved, and it is a cylinder, a pipe shape, coming out. And then it has beveled edges on the end. It goes up into a sort of fan, into a Y shape, and out like that, with two holes, perfectly symmetrical through its vertical cross-section, perfectly symmetrical along its pipe cross-section. And I'm thinking, well, that's Tech not, yeah, that's, that's, that's technology. Right. it's technology. Yeah, it's made by beings. And um, so I wrote to NASA, because I always do, because people often say, oh, this is this, and NASA lies. I always email NASA, not in my real name, obviously. Right. And uh, NASA said, oh, it's a venti fact. It's a form formed by wind erosion. And I said, what, a perfectly symmetrical through its horizontal and vertical cross-section venti fact. So then I typed into Google, ask a geologist. Turns out you can ask a geologist anything in loads of universities. And I uh, asked about I don't know, five or six of them all around the world. And uh, I got two answers. Uh, one was American. And what, which university was it? Because it made me think they might have known it was on Mars. Or I don't know. Or maybe my email's on a list. You know, don't <laughs> answer this guy's questions. And he said, oh, well, it could be a venti fact, you know, but, but we just don't know. Right. right. So was this a, a Mars orbiter image? Or a no, this is a, a rover. This is a rover image. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Interesting. It, it, well, I'm not aware of the image you're talking about, but we can put that on the screen and uh, I'll certainly study it. I know that Andrew Johnson has pointed out various anomalies in the orbiter images, uh, one that th he thinks is some sort of dome within a crater that he, he thinks is... Right. Or, Suggests is man-made. There's or, a few or, of them, or not natural. Yeah. There's yeah. a huge golf ball dome in one of them, and there's even there's one. That, I mean, the surface of Mars is incredible anyway. It's so alien-looking. Yeah, assuming these are real pictures mm. of Mars, mm. which I do. Um, I'm not. I, I don't poo-poo uh, the idea that maybe there are orbiters around Mars. Mm. Um, it's yeah. You, you, I don't know if you've watched my lecture on it on the on the actual rovers. Um, I again, think it did, yeah, you and Andrew discussing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, there's certainly a lot of doubt in my mind over it. I wouldn't, I'm not 100%. I wouldn't yeah. uh, 
there's, there's also the the, uh, the conference where the engineers have been asked questions and they just they don't know anything about the, the technology. That's yeah. what it comes across to me. But but anyway, yeah. well, I guess I, I'm not going to put my life on it. And it's the same with the moon landings as well. Yeah. I'm not. You mentioned we mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. You said the door. So some of the technology seems dubious and doubtful. Mm. Uh, and some of the hazards. How could we have got past them? Yeah. So. Yeah. Right. So, so you, so you don't, you don't think that uh, man walked on the moon? No, I don't think. Uh, I don't think man even got to the moon and orbited it. Right. Simply because of the radiation, the Van Allen belts. Right. Uh, and I don't think, I don't think the film could have survived the intense radiation from the sun. No atmosphere to shield it. No magnetosphere to shield it. I don't think you could take photos on the moon with, with the Hasselblad right. they had there anyway. So, so assuming that the Apollo was a hoax, it means that you can't really trust anything coming out of NASA, does it? Doesn't well, the, the National Association of Space Actors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so you're going on, you are going on filtered information, even when you're talking about these. Yeah. We're going on what they've given us, aren't we? Yeah. Not that I'm trying to poo-poo that there's a gas pipeline oh, yeah, no, on you're Mars. Right. It's a weird situation because I'm saying, assuming that these are real, I think those objects are <laughs> man-made. <laughs> so it's kind of topsy-turvy. All right, and Gary, it's been fascinating talking to you. And they have allowed you to um, start using computers again, and so you're working in the field of computers, and you're also self-employed, which is which is good news. Yeah, good to be working again. Um, now, the other thing that you're considering, or you've already embarked upon, is you writing a book. Just tell us about that. Yeah, um, I've done about four and a half chapters, and um, so it's, it's about half finished. I should finish it by I don't know spring next year. But uh, I did approach some major European publishers, but they publishers have their own perception of the market, and uh, they want me to write about you know the darkness and the suicide and the despair, and it's really somewhere I don't want to revisit. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that writing about you know the hacking. You, you want to write a nerdy book? I do. I want yeah. to write just what it was like to be you know an average guy, and mm. the typical nerd loves his sci-fi or her sci-fi and UFOs, and mm. so I want to you know like the nerd that went too far. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, as I always say, <laughs> the nerd shall inherit the earth. I think. <laughs> but yeah, um, it's been fascinating listening to you, Gary, and thanks for coming all the way to South oh, Wales. And, uh, good, good luck with the book and good luck with the business. Thank you. And uh, I hope to leave you alone um, from now on. So do I. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And remember, believe none of what you hear and only half of what you see. I'm Richard D. Hall. Good night.